All right, appears to be live and such. So I'll just do a little check, make sure we have adequate uh, audio quality Peter's and whatnot. Appears to be live and such. All right, now the chat should be on. I don't know if the last video it was off for some reason, but maybe they say it was off when nobody chats. I don't know. But anyway, it should be on. So uh, somebody not listening at the moment because there would probably be nobody in the room. So there's no point in me suggesting somebody say something because, frankly, uh, no point. Uh, but anyway, um, so where are we? Uh, no viewers. That's not too good. Yes, uh, but obviously it's just start at the room. <laughs> Um, so for the people watching later, um, the last video I did was pretty good. It was actually on a lecture series of videos, and, um, you know, I know those aren't very popular, but it was uh, number 25. <clears throat> in the first 10 minutes or 15 minutes or so, I'm explaining uh, conductors and why they produce uh, a certain amount of, uh, a certain magnetism that seems, um, wrong in the sense that likes attract instead of repel and all that stuff and it's a very good explanation and later in the video there's actually a very good explanation of how the difference between current and voltage really good <laughs> so anyway so, so it's now a long video but there are parts of it that are quite good <clears throat> just saying just pointing out that uh, if you're going to watch one of the videos that would probably be the one to watch so I figure I would uh, play some of the Al Kahari guys, uh, one of his documentaries, just horrible. These the subscriptions are all kind of boring. Uh, the dissident science guy did another fake Higgs thing where he's reading from some guy's book where there's just no depth to the argument. There's just this idea, well, it's a fake because it's only a one-time experiment and you know, all these people have been collected, uh, you know, self-selected process or whatever group speak or however you want to say it and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, all that stuff's true, but that doesn't prove, it doesn't disprove or demonstrate anything called a fake. So it's just more, you know, people making claims they don't back up with any evidence, which, uh, you know, it's just sort of not the right thing to be doing. So we'll hop along. Feeling a little buggy today, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, just not, not quite right. I think this is the crappy video, yes. So I think we'll play some of this crap and just point out how it's crap. Yeah, it's <clears throat> not very good. Uh, it's not either. It's not good philosophy or physics. It's uh, no. It's not way it should be done. Um, too much hype. Um, the, the, the insane exaggerations over and over. Every experiment, oh, this is the greatest experiment. This was the greatest experiment. This was the greatest moment in his, uh, this was great, you know. This quantum mechanics is the most proven theory in the history of mankind. Blah, blah, blah. It's all this hype talk. It just doesn't have anything to do with reality. Um, and is uh, therefore quite annoying and worthy of ridicule and poking fun at and such, so that's what I'll do. Called Victor Hess, made one of the most astonishing discoveries in science. The most astonishing a discovery in science. Some guy named Hess, who most people haven't heard of. The most astonishing discoveries in science. Never heard of. Up here, Hess found an incredibly mysterious rays of energy. Incredibly mysterious rays of energy, again, you know, just all this, even photons are mysterious at the, at the time. The, the light coming off from the sun is, uh, it was mysterious at the time. We're pouring in from outer space and streaming through the Earth. They were incredibly powerful, and yet unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. So, <clears throat> no evidence of their extreme power at the time. Um, nobody would use the word power to, to with something that was... Uh, that went right through stuff because that would be almost like it was invisible, so tiny, you know, it was like it was nothing. Obviously it goes right through you, who cares? It's weak, it's not strong. 
people don't really rationally associate things that don't do any damage as being powerful. They were called cosmic rays. At the same time, in the laboratories down below, scientists were studying equally mysterious and equally powerful rays of energy pouring out from the interior of atoms, energy known as radioactivity. Mysterious rays from the vast emptiness of space and mysterious rays from deep within the atom, the tiniest building block. No one really understands. So again, <clears throat> to just add context, everything, the, the magnet is... It could could have been perceived quite easily as something obviously admitting mysterious rays that allowed it to know which way the other magnet was in and all this stuff. So there's lots of stuff that was in the category of weird phenomenon. So again, just this is hype. What they were, let alone the legal definition of what they were. Then an incredible... I think lots of people thought that all of them were connected. Uh, so I talked about unification theories and, you know, ways of tying it all together. And, um, you know, the wrong turn was after Maxwell, where, you know, you just, you didn't get it. Uh, you know, the forces aren't like light. Light is a force, you know. Story unfolded. Cosmic rays and radioactivity turned out to be connected in a way so shocking that it beggars belief. It beggars belief. Um, anyway, it begs. But anyway, um, um, uh, you know, I, I, in hindsight, I'm just saying they really didn't know anything about anything. So everything was there for the figuring out. The discovery of this connection would force us to rethink the nature of reality itself. Yeah, no, it wouldn't. That was your choice to drink the poison retard pill of turning the universe into mush. Um, the, the obvious connection was they all end up, all these forces end up having the same speed, which just is an obvious reason to start saying uh, they're brother and sister of the same thing. They're, they're related some substantial way. And instead, you decide to go exactly the opposite way and turn everything into a, a separate field and a separate function. You know, no, it's all the same thing. The world we think we know, the solid, reassuring world of our senses, turns out to be just a tiny sliver of an infinitely weirder, more wonderful universe. Just the pile, just, just that hype. I mean, an infinitely weirder and wonderful universe. Now, it's simpler than they thought not more complicated and it's just this is just side this is just hype tiny shreds of evidence draw these conclusions that there's any real mysterious anything here the universe everywhere we look it is so reliable so boring in its function you know everywhere we look microscope telescope boring boring reliable dependable simple and, and look at all this hypey talk because they think they found some scope where they can see the little see the little gremlins that are actually are making it all happen. There's no gremlins. Ever conceived of in our wildest fantasy. Oh, bullshit. Yeah, it's all you're doing is fantasizing. You're not doing science. You're certainly not backing up your claims with any voluminous evidence. Our reality is just an illusion. Okay. <laughs> everybody's reality is just an illusion in your head okay so everybody's living in the model of reality that's in their head uh, so and that model is just an illusion a projection um but the physical universe is a physical universe with physical stuff and there's snow on those mountains there's rocks there are atoms of different pressure and different configuration and there's all kinds of radiation, uh, little bits, flying around all the time, deciding the temperature of things and the motion of things. Everything that's moving is moving because a force is pushing it, and the force is made of something. It's not nothing, it's something. Oh, I hated the music for this series of dinkle-donkle music. Hmm.
in the years of so all that bullshit just to say the word adam <laughs> wow yeah that, that needed music to the mid 1920s the atom revealed its strange secrets to us at a prodigious rate as it produced one scientific revolution after another uh, revolutions based on single experiments and interpretations of single experiments that's probably a big mistake is to draw conclusions too quickly and that's all this is about is drawing conclusions too quickly in 1897 Marie Curie studied strange rays pouring out of some rare metals she called them radioactivity then, in 1905, Albert Einstein conclusively proved the existence and size of an atom by studying the way pollen moves in water. A few years later, the New Zealander, Ernest Rutherford, performed an experiment in Manchester that revealed to him the shape of the interior of an atom. Revealed to him. Uh, so again, he speculated a, a model. He drew, he had some uh, facts and he tried to fit a model to those facts. And um, good guesses, bad guesses, it doesn't really matter. The point is, is that as you get more information, you have to update the model. And instead, we've just, um, you know, taken the more information and tried to force it to fit an old model. Scientists were shocked to discover that the atom is almost entirely empty space. So again, it, to discover it, to, to demonstrate, to prove it, and again, the evidence is a little bit narrow or thin, but it's not bad in the sense that you shoot stuff through thin pieces of matter. Uh, and you, if, if the stuff gets through that you know it's going to hit certain things, then you can sort of tell how likely it is that there's those things, how much of the space is occupied by those things. And they sort of found out that most of the time when you throw something through atoms, you're not hitting anything, but there's a lot of atoms and stuff. So eventually it hits something. This is a lot of them. The question then became, how could this empty atom possibly make the solid world around us? The answer to that was worked out by a group of revolutionary physicists in Denmark. Really wasn't. So this is where it all goes wrong. So they come up with some whack theory. <laughs> you know, instead of uh, drawing um, logical conclusions that the whole thing is held together by magnetism and blah, 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 they have their own, you know, randomness controlling the universe bullshit. They proposed that the world of the atom ran on principles which were completely different to any mankind had ever seen before. It meant that the atom, the basic building block of everything in the universe, was unique and perhaps outside human comprehension. Uh, outside human comprehension. Unique compared to what? Of course, atoms are unique. I mean, the different elements anyway. And, um, you know, but obviously there's the structure isn't unique you know it's, it's like humans are unique snowflakes are unique each individual one's a little tiny bit difference but the differences become a little bit unrecognizable as a practical fact rats all look like rats Prehension. then as scientists explored the nucleus the tiny heart of the atom they found it bursting with powerful energy this discovery so the irony of this part is is the nucleus isn't the part that has the energy the energy is in the electrons between them and when you free all the electrons by destroying the nucleus then you release the energy but the irony is is the nucleus of the atom is a place where there's low pressure that's what's holding the protons together so they're not being pushed together as you'd think they had to originally be pushed together but in the sense once you got them close enough to each other with the neutrons and the electron that's tied to the neutron the electron got rid of all the electron pressure uh you know the proton pressure 
and <clears throat> depress substantially depressurize the nucleus. So the nucleus isn't where the real power is. Uh, anyway, uh, it's the electrons. And when you free the electrons, that's when you free the photons. And that's what makes a nuclear bomb. So they don't even have this part right. Because you see, they think it's a strong force that's holding the... You know, I'll draw it real quick. I mean, it's an important piece of stuff. Um, where am I? Where am I? What am I doing? Uh, let's just put that one down. And that should give me the drawing. Yes. Um, so, so the point is, is that the nucleus has got uh, protons in it, and neutrons have an electron. So we'll just draw a real couple of protons. And, so here's a couple of protons, and then let's say there's a neutron in here, and the neutron has, uh, so this is essentially a proton, the neutron <laughs> has a proton, and so I'm just trying to make a di distinction, the nu neutron, and um, so that's the neutron proton, and then it has an electron, and this one electron could essentially get rid of all the red force eventually, so no red so typically, when two protons would be brought together, they have a bunch of reflective force between them, the red force. And so as you bring them together, it would take incredible pressure to get them that close to form a nucleus. But if you have an electron in here, the electron just dissipates all of the pressure. All the pressure leaves through this one electron, bounces, 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 it all just keeps leaving. So all the pressure leaves through the electron, all the red pressure, and obviously any black pressure leaves through one of these protons, so that's no problem. So this becomes a very low pressure zone in here. And that's what holds the nucleus together. So it's not a big, huge amount of pressure coming from the outside, pushing all this, holding all this stuff together. And then you're releasing the pressure of the nucleus. The nucleus is very low pressure. The high pressure is between the electrons. They're the ones that still have force between them, bouncing back and forth. They're the ones that are pressurized. They're the ones with all the photons. So when you, when you free the electrons, that's when you release all the energy between them in, in the form of photons of <coughs> various energy levels. Uh, and uh, that's, that's where the energy comes from. Gave them the potential to bring about the destruction of the Earth. But in a shocking turnaround, it also gave them a fundamental understanding of how the universe itself was created. Okay, so it's not a, it's a fundamentally wrong understanding. Clearly, it takes pressure, again, to get things in arrangements. But once they're in the arrangement, once you put the magnets in the right arrangement, they can be quite durable. So if I'm able to put magnets, <coughs> magnets don't flip course you have to keep thinking of magnetic monopoles the electrons are monopoles the protons are monopoles they don't flip so they're like having magnets that won't flip so once you put them in the right positions you know uh, likes uh, uh, repelling and and uh, this number is attracting they'll, they can stay in that position the position can be uh, rigid um, it's under tension there's just as much going in force as there is separation force. So there's no, the two are balanced and the thing will stay in that configuration. And yet despite this, the journey to understand the strange and capricious pattern had only just started. Yeah, you never, and you tripped on the starting line. Um, you know, going with bent space, something's moving the speed of light right? Gravity. And you turn it into some sort of bent, fake thing, some invisible man, bent invisible man space, and then throw time in it to twist everything all up. You know, when time is just the function that going the speed of light means you're going slow, <laughs> slower than instantaneous. And as soon as you go slower than instantaneous, there's a thing called time. Time isn't in a dimension. And then you, you warp uh, quantum mechanics with all this wooey entanglement and waves and interference and nonsense. 
So yeah, you didn't get off the starting line. You tripped and fell down a, a, a rabbit hole of your own creation, not one that you really saw, not one your demonstrator proved, just one you made up. Scientific type people need all this drama music, you see. That's the, that helps scientists think. <laughs> you know, real thinking people always need music or they just can't understand anything and absorb the information. They need scenery and music and they need to be romanced to be able to understand their physics. Really quite pitiful. <laughs> In 1927, a young man was studying at the mathematics department of Cambridge University. Shy, awkward, clumsy, and frighteningly brilliant. His name... Says you, but okay. ...was Paul Adrienne Maurice Dirac. So this is, a, this is again, this is the profile of crazy the Looney Tune. Uh, <laughs> Antiparticles... Let's, you know, let's just take what we have as evidence. You know, oh, these protons are too close together. Uh, there's mega forces doing it. And the mega force can only be the mega force. But it, yes, the mega force is destroyed by the unforce. And I mean, just turned into a bunch of super characters. I mean, Dirac's mathematics is just basically saying everything's a super character and has super properties and can move forward and backward in time and can antiparticle and all this crap. So yeah, frighteningly brilliant. This is where they went wrong was following this guy. It's probably fair to say that Paul Dirac isn't a household name, but he should be. He was recently- Says you, <laughs> again, says the phantasmagorical wacky guy who thinks life is a quantum effect. Yeah, sure. Unicorn chaser says so. Voted by other physicists as the second greatest English physicist of all time. Oh, well, that's your own, uh, your own bad there. Okay, <laughs> just your own bad. Second only to Isaac Newton. And he deserves the accolade. All the brilliant minds that pioneered atomic physics were left trailing by Dirac, aghast at the sheer boldness and lateral thinking in his work. Whatever that means, bold and lateral. Somehow that's important. So ignore, you know, jump the evidence, bold. Jump the evidence, you know. Have your horses push the cart. <laughs> yeah. When Einstein read a paper by the then 24-year-old Dirac, he said, I have trouble with Dirac. This balancing on the dizzying path between genius and madness is awful. In 1927, for reasons... No I'd say way too much madness, way too little genius myself, but this is my opinion. We'll see what time will tell. No one has ever really fathomed. Paul Dirac set himself a task which was monumental in its scope. To unify science. I <laughs> didn't come even close to that, did he? Obviously, he fail <laughs> on its face. To bring its scattered parts into one beautiful entity. And then fail, fail, fail. And what this wave particle duality entanglement, antiparticles. That's unifying something. No, that's just making a mess. Meant above all was to unite the two most difficult and counterintuitive ideas in history. In history, he said, the two most counterintuitive ideas in the history of ideas. Oh, please. Here's what Dirac was trying to reconcile. First, there's quantum mechanics, a set of mathematical equations that describe the atom and its component parts some formulas that describe effects we see effects we can see that a certain amount of energy goes in and a certain there's a thing called voltage and there's things called wattage and there's things called mass and there's velocity and there's acceleration there's these things that we can see 
and we can kind of put those frequency and we can throw those together and figure out effects. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, as long as you don't project causes, you know, until you can demonstrate them. And there's Einstein's special theory of relativity. Complete horse shit, okay, which isn't E equals MC squared. That's more like quantum mechanics. E equals MC squared isn't freaking freaking uh, relativity. So let's not combine the two. Uh, let's not slander E equals MC squared, a perfectly rational conclusion with the irrational conclusion that space is somehow warped or bent, which in three dimensions means it's there's a vacuum cleaner inside of every single material particle sucking some kind of space, removing it, and somehow the matter bits know the empty space is missing and they have to move into the void. Uh, preposterous nonsense, and again, this stupid time warping nonsense, the turning time at the simple function that velocity movement from a distance across distance takes time. Even for the fastest thing, it takes time for it to do that. That's not a dimension, it's just a fact. <laughs> There's no dimension. There's no red dimension. It's just a fact that the frequency is red. There's no mass dimension. There's no, I mean, there's things that people have, properties. Every property isn't a freaking dimension. Time is just a property. It's just a, a velocity. That's all it is. Which at first glance seems completely unrelated to the atom. It deals with loftier matters like the nature of space and time. And you no, know, yeah, the nature of the thing that's supposed to be nothing. So the nothing is not nothing, it's the something. So it's just an ether theory that you're disguising in some sort of space time. You're calling it space time, but what it really is is jello time, pudding time. That's all it is. You're just turning space into some sort of goopy medium that is somehow uh, augmented by <clears throat> some process inside every sing single atom, some process for which you have no explanation. I mean, it's really that bad. It is so bad. It's completely invisible man uh, uh, did it. It's, it's the worst of causes. It's just a magical cause. Cells. One of its consequences is that objects behave very differently when they travel close to the speed of light. So more nonsense about stuff that really doesn't have anything to do with basic physics because this doesn't really happen too often. Stuff doesn't often travel the speed of light. Nothing mysterious happens when, a, say, a current is moving through a wire, a very good wire, a low resistance, and it moves very close to the speed of light. Nothing warpy or weird or insane happens. It's not that complicated. It's just it becomes harder and harder to push something once it's getting essentially lighter and lighter. All its mass is moving in one direction. If all the fish are swimming in the same way, then it's a bunch of fish swimming the same way. It's not a school of fish anymore. It's just a herd of fish. <sighs> no. Subtle difference. There's no doing anything else. It's basically when you move matter at the speed of light, you've turned it into light. You've turned it into a force. It no longer has any material properties. It just has force properties. Very simple. Oh, gee, brilliant comment there, J.F. J for fucker. Right? Jay the fucker. <laughs> Jay the useless fucker. Brilliant. Brilliant counter argument. Brilliant. Why don't you explain bent space? How, how does it get bent? That is, how does it get consumed? What's, how does the atom consume the bent space? How does it do that, Jay? Jay ever? Oh, I just, I, people are just amazing. Retard. The, he types one word, defining a retard. That's what a retard types is one fucking word because that's all they can handle. <sighs> Oxymoron. The first thing you might ask is why would anyone want to reconcile two such different theories? Well, I mean, just insanely stupid. Yes, why would somebody want to think that the universe has a consistent and um, um, one set of rules that it doesn't function based on completely different rules. Why would somebody think that sounds wrong, that the combustion engine is both a solar engine and a gasoline engine or something, or it's 
two completely different things. Our heads are actually our asses and our asses are our heads. Why would somebody want to say that doesn't make any fucking sense? You, you can't have a universe has one thing that moves the speed of light bent space. Magnetism moves the speed of light and it's completely made of something different, a virtual photon. And then you have real photons doing real forces right in front of your face. Uh, yeah, you'd want to say, no, these things somehow have to tie up. You can't have these all being done by gremlins, uh, boogeyman, Sasquatch, the abominable snowman. You don't blame it on every piece of wacky crap you make up. Oh, you look it up, Jay. I mean, these aren't arguments. Fuck you in the ass till dead. Get what you deserve out of life, which is run over, you stupid piece of shit. You didn't make anything called a fucking argument, you lazy cunt. God damn. People like you should be taken out and shot. You shouldn't be able to just talk shit like this. I mean, it's just so lazy. You're such an insult to intelligence. Well, by the late 1920s, the equations of quantum mechanics were consistently getting the wrong answers when describing electrons, or the constituents of atoms, as they moved at very high speed. So more just nonsense. Like I said, electrons don't do anything magical when they move at very high speed. There's no magical event happens. No, no singularities pop out of anywhere. Oh, just more crap. And again, high speeds measured how? How do you measure the speed of the electron <laughs> you know, itself? Oh, that's right. You really can't. All you can do is move, measure the speed of electrons traveling most of the time through atomic mediums of some kind, some sort of atomic structure. Not a free electron in any sense. But for Dirac, there was a much more esoteric motivation. He was once quoted as saying that a physical theory must have mathematical beauty. Uh, bullshit. This, this, this is, again, this, this notion that formalizing effects is demonstrating causes is insanely stupid. That's not how you do causes. Just paying attention to effects. That's not how you do it. So for him, the fact that quantum mechanics and relativity weren't reconciled wasn't just inconvenient. It was downright ugly. Yeah, well, it's more than just ugly. Again, it's, it's irrational to perceive the, the mechanics <clears throat> and have these two different things have to interact and be parallel with each other. Because they really can't be. They can't combine if they're, you, you can't mix spirit water with, uh, you know, voodoo force. <coughs> it wouldn't work. They would, they, they would irritate each other. They would create some sort of inconsistent effect. The fact that all these effects are so consistent means that these things have to be made out of the same thing. They can't be oil and water. They can't be relatively oil, relativity oil, and quantum mechanic water. It won't work. So around 1925 in Cambridge, Dirac put his extraordinary mind, a mind that even Einstein had trouble keeping up with. Well, it says you again. I mean, Einstein makes one comment, you know, yeah, so now I'll say Einstein couldn't keep up with him. No, Einstein had some critique. He's saying, well, look, some of this stuff looks really good but it looks like it might be a little bit insane like it's not going to go anywhere but crazy town it wasn't exactly applause <laughs> okay to work this is room a4 of new court and it was dirac's original study it's the original fireplace has been oh it's so, so special i'm getting all gooey inside Oh, look at it. It's such a special room. It's so specially furnished and so specially special. You just sat around looking at nothing on a green couch, you're telling me. Boarded up now. Boarded up for what reason? Right, exactly. They couldn't even paint the fireplace on there or something just to give you the idea they had a fireplace? It was here that Dirac tried to understand and bring together the two new ideas of 20th century physics. I don't know why he's talking about how he tried to do something he failed to do. So why is this impressive? He tried to do it and he clearly failed to do it. He catastrophically failed to do it because nobody can do it because they're not reconcilable.
you're not going to reconcile producing a virtual photon with consuming Ben's space. Both of the ideas are stupid. It's stupid and idiot. You're not going to make a brilliant baby out of stupid and idiot. Now, word is Dirac would sit here in front of his blazing fireplace and and hit on the chicks, no doubt. I mean, that's a that's a hit on chick couch. Try and I got one of those. Understand and bring together these two different theories into one unified picture. He keeps talking like he did it. He didn't do that. <laughs> Jeez, he's talking like this is what he did. No, he failed. He failed. One single equation. Blah, 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 blah. For three frustrating years, he labored alone. Then, one evening in early 1928, he had an amazing revelation. Only by your opinion, okay? Again, this amazing revelation that somehow I can create antiparticles and somehow antiparticles will so solve a problem inside of atoms. When we know inside of atoms, there's protons, neutrons, and electrons. They're what define the character of the atom. They're define what happens inside of the atom. All of this crap doesn't unify gravity, time, and quantum mechanics. It just doesn't do any of this. The only way I can explain what happened is to say that the equations of quantum mechanics and special relativity coalesced inside Dirac's mind. <coughs> The, the equations have to have some commonality because guess what? It's all the same force. And yes, they are unifiable, but they're not unifiable with abstract idiotic annihilation events. They're unifiable by just recognizing them as what it is. It's all one force, a pushing force, and all the quantum mechanical uh, uh, variations are just a variation of what filtering does to the force. When it's filtered, it does some things. There's such a thing as material filters. Atoms are essentially filters. Each atom filters, processes the universe that comes in and gives you a different universe out through the filter that is that unique arrangement, period. Einstein's description of space and time somehow stretched and squeezed the existing equations of the atom. They bent and twisted them into all sorts of new weird and wonderful shapes. Uh, it's just this is just hype. I mean, this is just mush. Show me, show me where there's some some equation that does that that somehow squeezes out the essence of something. They're doing exactly the opposite. They're complexing something that's simple and hiding the truth in a, a, so much complexity that you're never going to find it. Then, guided by his unshakable belief that nature's laws must be beautiful, Dirac honed in on one equation, an entirely new description of what goes on inside the atom. And it's just horseshit. Again, this, this equation does not uh, resolve relativity with quantum mechanics, with wave duality, with any of this stuff. It doesn't fix any of it. Why all this hype? This more nonsense about some uh, obtuse notion of mathematical beauty. I annihilate what I create and come up with zero. Cool. It's beautiful. One minus one equals zero. Oh, it's beautiful. Does that have anything to do with the truth or reality or bent space or any of that? No. Can't even show it to us without blur vision. <coughs> Why? Funny thing. I D. Funny stuff below. Minus E A U thingy. Uh, whatever spear thingy equals blah blah. Oh, great. Yes, that fixes everything. Here it is. The Dirac equation. 
gamma mu is id mu minus ea mu psi equals m psi don't try and understand it just look at it yes just wonder why you have size on both sides here when you rationally the thing to do is just go crossy out crossy out so that's my first issue <laughs> what do i need to what on each side for <laughs> so you're both you're multiplying both sides by psi what is it there for a marvel as far as human achievements go it's up there with king lear beethoven's fifth or the origin of the species this is just this is i don't know where he gets this from where does he get this impression that it does any of that crap I just don't know where it is. I mean, where's the example of this equation being used in the real world somewhere ever? Where? I mean, where? Oh, I mean, these same old nothing arguments. Little F full Flynn, whatever that is. You don't need some fake name, <laughs> you know. Your problem is you're too dumb to understand math. Again, sh sh demonstrate it. Demonstrate how you're smart enough to do math. What what math do you think I'm challenged by? In, in a sense that what what a real world equation has any, that has something to do with something real happening, like the velocity of a current in a wire or something else. Where does any of this shit have anything to do with what he claimed it had to do with, which is some sort of unification? Where demonstrate to me how this equation unifies anything? Ask white. No, there's no point. I, I mean, it's just not an argument. You, you, you're, and in time, you're the one that's going to have shit on your face. You know, you, you will anonymous weasel. I mean, the fact that you've bought into a bunch of, of fairy princess, little girly pink panty theories of reality, that's your bad that you fell for this crap bent space virtual photon. What kind of asshole falls for that as an answer? Oh, if their magnets attract each other because of the virtual photons they're admitting. They're attraction tons. <laughs> yeah, is that it? It's all you have. It's baby talk, loser. Because hidden in these symbols is the perfect description of how reality works at a fundamental level. It's the key to nature's... The one with a college education. So I just did. I've, I've just been playing Professor Lewin's videos. So why don't you go to the last episode, which is 25. All right. And there's a, the beginning of that video. The first 15 minutes explains how it's not, uh, you know, electricity uh, creating EMF and all this bullshit. It's just one force. There's, there's no uh, electromagnetic force. There's just one force. There's not two different fields. There's not nothing perpetuating through your little fake ethery bullshit. What's your college degree in anyway? It's clearly not physics. Oh, you're just, yes, yeah, so, so you're too pussy to make an argument. So you're saying your flat earth theory is wrong, but I can't make a constructive argument. All I'm going to do is insult you. Well, fuck you. All right, so you think it's a flat earth theory. Well, why don't you just demonstrate with a rational argument? I mean, I can just point out to a flat earther, well, then what about the fact that if I'm on a boat in the water and I, I sail towards the land, the, the tall buildings show up first? Why is that happening if the world's flat? I can make arguments. Why don't you make a fucking argument, loser? Secret code. With perfect mathematical elegance, Dirac's equation describes an atomic particle traveling at any speed, right up to the speed of light. So again, there's nothing mysterious about the speed of light. Again, it's so easy to understand, right? Atoms have, have stuff moving in them. You can get that much, right? So if I moved an atom, you can sort of understand there's stuff going this way, there's stuff going all kinds of directions. And if I started to move it close to the speed of light, it really wouldn't make much sense, right? Because if the electron's going around this way, right, then it's got motion in this direction already, maybe a quarter of the speed of light this way. And then if I make the nucleus move the speed of light, and this is going uh, a quarter of the speed of light, then this, this electron will end up going faster than the speed of light. So obviously this can't stay together. 
the atom can't stay together and have parts going in all kinds of directions when it's moving the speed of light, right? I can't be going this way if I'm going the speed of light this way. So clearly matter can't go anywhere near the real speed of light because it has bits that are moving in directions that just aren't going to allow that. It's not possible because then the bits have to be faster than the force and they can't be. Gee, that's really hard to figure out. No, it's really easy to deduce. That much Dirac was expecting to achieve. But when he looked at his own equation more carefully... This is like he's standing next to a totem pole. Oh, the totem pole represents this is the eagle god, and the, the eagle god lays the eggs that, you know, you can have soft-boiled or hard-boiled, a golden, beautiful egg. And I mean, it's just a, it's just religion. Well, you bet wrong. You want to bet a billion dollars that I'm not a high school dropout? I would have been okay with dropping out, frankly. I mean, I, I, <laughs> in a sense, they kind of forced me to get a diploma because I didn't give a shit. But whatever, ass wipe, you're done here. You're not making an argument. And, and, you know, calling somebody a high school, again, calling somebody a high school dropout is basically saying you were smart enough to say, these assholes have no business being teachers. They're stupid. They're dumb fucks. You want to learn something in the world. You're not going to learn them from this institution of dull and boring and cliche uh, uh, indoctrination. It's a goddamn prison system. You don't go to a prison system to become fucking educated. Asshole. He noticed something breathtakingly revolutionary about it. He later said his equation knew more than he did. In essence, Dirac's equation... So, so even that makes no sense. Oh, my equation is smarter than I am. <laughs> oh, it's so much more, you know, it has bigger eyes and can see much further than I can. That's what that little spirit thing does. ...was telling him that there's another universe we've never noticed before. No, oh, fuck. I mean, it's language. There's another universe. No, there isn't. There's one universe. Rational people try to accurately describe the one universe. They don't sit there and reach for your phantasmagorical, invisible dimensions of special specialness. This is such a religion. I have to get background music, right? Gary's going to say something important. It's very scientific. You can't learn anything about science without. <laughs> yeah, the Higgs field is, is, is the poo inside of the talking caterpillar. That's what the fucking Higgs field is. Because instead of his equation having one answer, it has two. The first describes the universe we know, made of the atoms we're familiar with. The second... <laughs> yes, okay. So he starts off with something real and then just adds a bunch of fruitcake. He just sits there and just frosts over the whole thing because he says, I don't like to eat oatmeal. I want something with the, you know, little sparkles in it and such and some glitter describes a kind of mirror image to our universe, made of atoms whose properties are somehow reversed. Now, science fiction fans will know what's coming. As well as matter, Dirac's equation predicts the existence of antimatter. Horseshit, again, it predicts the existence of. It necessitates the existence of something to balance the equation because they have no balance, because they have a bunch of fake energy in the universe. They have the obvious problem of planets moving towards suns and they have the obvious problem of magnets moving towards each other and they don't have a place for the energy to come from but the energy is real in the universe so somehow they have to get rid of it again right because it's actually real energy it has a real consequence when the two magnets fly together they move a bunch of air in the atmosphere out and they do lots of things that are physically real so there's a real physical consequence to that energy, but they have no conservation law that ties it together. They have no explanation for where it came from. So now they can just make it all go away by antiparticling it. And yet we never have any evidence that these antiparticles actually do anything, that they actually 
function in some way, that they're actually in the atom somewhere. No, they don't exist as part of any cause. They just exist as an effect, a convenient effect, something to make your equations balance, not something to make reality balance. Dirac's theory seemed to say that for everything in our known world... I mean, this is just all such a look oh, good. Let's get a helicopter and we'll drone. No, let's get a drone and we'll fly it around me and I'll look all impressive on the edge of the Scottish cliffs or something. I mean, what a pile of crap. For every part of an atom, every particle, there can exist a corresponding antiparticle with the same mass but exactly opposites in every other way. <clears throat> yes, and then it can be entangled, and it's just so convenient because we needed some way to entangle everything. And so they might as well start preaching ESP. You might as well go all the way back to the 50s, and you ought to start, you know, making clock hands turn and do all kinds of, make things move across the desk by waving your arms. Why don't you just go all the way, bullshit, shyster, crook. And just like a world in a mirror, a universe made of antimatter atoms would look and work just like ours. It would be perfectly possible for me to be made entirely out of antimatter. <clears throat> no, yeah, so, so, you know, this is the idiotic part. Yes, you could just reverse the poles on the magnet, right? Just reverse them and everything goes upside down and left, right becomes right, left and up becomes down, down becomes up, and everything stays the same because what you did is just change the polarity. whoop de do So yes, you make the protons negative, you make the electrons positive. Yes, you're gonna have the same universe. Give the same rules, just change the color. So just take the checkerboard and the checkers and just reverse the colors. <laughs> so make the black squares red, make the red squares black, and make the black checkers red, and the red checkers black. There, I've done something magical. No, there's nothing magical in that horse shit. <coughs> Anti me would look and behave exactly the same as the original me. And indeed, it's possible that out there. Except he would be inverted left, right, and up, down. <laughs> yeah, except for that. In the vast expanses of the cosmos, there are stars and planets and even living beings made out of antimatter. And there's one final. So, so again, this is. These, the, the, this guy is saying that this is how uh, somehow Dirac should be applauded because he made up this fairy theory, okay, that has a whole bunch more complexity to it, right? I mean, the Allison, it's a lot more stuff than just the rabbit with his clock. I mean, there's all kinds of wacky characters. And uh, you're, you're buying the, the, you know, okay, the rabbit, I can buy the rabbit. All right. I don't really buy the invisible cat, and I don't really buy talking caterpillar. But I buy the rabbit. Yeah. You know, you're just, you're bad. It's all crap. Fiction of the Dirac equation. As its punchline, it states that matter and antimatter must never come into contact. Because if they do, they will annihilate each other in a fierce conflagration of pure energy. Just more nonsense. There's no pure such thing as pure energy. There's just energy. And energy is just an imbalance in the system. Any system that has an imbalance, that's you'll see what will be called energy. The energy is always there. The energy is always in the sense uh, there in the sense of pressure. And all you're seeing is imbalances in pressure. The tree moves because imbalances on in the pressure. Everything moves because there's an imbalance in pressure. That's it. There's nothing else more complicated. And there's no anti-pressure and unpressure the annihilation means zero it doesn't mean woo, 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 we blew something up and all kinds of crap is going to happen no annihilation means nothing happens nothing it means left hits right nothing the combined mass of matter and antimatter would convert completely into energy according to einstein's famous equation e equals mc squared Presuming again, see, so there's just, there's just these leaps in in you know completely disconnected leaps in logic that somehow the whole atom blows up because the anti-electron hit the electron and annihilated and therefore made the atom into an ion. Is now a shorter electron. It's how the universe blows up. That didn't. That's not what Einstein said. So don't drag him into this crap. Now he's got his own crap. I mean, this no need to smear him with uh, somebody else's crap. 
pick on Einstein for his own bullshit. Don't pick on him because he thought any of this crap had any validity. So if I ever do meet my doppelganger, we would explode with an energy equivalent to a million Hiroshima-sized atom bombs. <clears throat> all he's saying is somehow all the energy in him would be released. The energy in him. Now, if you're going to say the antimatter is also going to have energy that gets released, then it would have to be two million Hiroshima bombs. You have to add up all the energy in you plus all the energy in him. The invisible man again. Again, this invisible character. Somehow there's invisible matter around, <laughs> okay, that somehow has gazillions, gazillion megawatts of energy in it, and that somehow we're going to access that by just walking into the antimatter man. I mean, it's just bullshit. I, I didn't realize how bad this video is. This is just awful, awful tripe. All this sounds like science fiction. No, it sounds like crap. It sounds like fantasy. It sounds like you don't have a shred of evidence defending any of this crap except oh we found a positron you know the anti-electron because we found a proton a low energy proton and we decided to call it okay an anti-particle pathetic and indeed the idea of antimatter has inspired huge swathes of it but the truth is antimatter particularly antimatter electrons called positrons are made routinely now in laboratories and somehow they never annihilate because they never hit their own special partner electron. See, that, that's the trick. The antimatter only works when it hits its little uh, special uh, love partner, the one that was the electron that was created at the same time. See, they were created at the same time. The little antiparticle and the particle. And the only time you blow up the universe is when the two special ones hit. <laughs> it's fucking... It's, you know, this is worse than three bears. It's so bad. Drones are used in sophisticated medical imaging devices called PET scanners that can see through our skulls. Right. This, this has nothing to do with positrons. I mean, it's just horseshit. I mean, it just has to do with uh, putting seeds of radiation in somebody. It's just another form of radioactive imaging. You know, and then they decide they're going to call it positronic because it sounds cool. They don't have any fucking evidence there's any positrons anywhere. And accurately map pictures of our brains. But back in the 1920s, the initial reaction to Dirac's equation among physicists was deeply skeptical. Even Dirac himself had trouble believing his own results. Antimatter seems such a preposterous concept. Then it still is a, a concept for which you have thin, weak, pathetic, shadowy, ghosty evidence. Nothing close to hard evidence. It's just like people saying they're Sasquatch because they saw, you know, a little bit of fur pop out of the side of a tree one day. And they said Sasquatch. You know, it's just the butt of a bear, but, you know, they call it Sasquatch. A resounding confirmation of the Dirac equation and all its paradoxical implications. And it came from the most unexpected place, outer space. In 1932, physicist Carl Anderson was working here at Caltech in Los Angeles when he made an amazing discovery. Amazing! Fantastic, incredible, the most amazing discovery in the history of mankind. Yes, another amazing, another, the most amazing discovery in the history of mankind. By a guy we never even heard of. He'd been studying cosmic rays. These are high energy subatomic particles that continuously bombard the Earth from outer space. Some of them are um, <laughs> uh, electrons. No, no. Wrong, wrong answer, Gary. The only thing stuff that can survive going across space are the photons. So it's a variety of a photon, X-rays, that kind of stuff, or you know, gamma, or it's the nucleus of helium. But that's it. Electrons and protons can't do this. 
because they still don't even understand velocity. They don't understand inertia and they don't understand that matter in its elemental form can't have it, uh, a durable inertia. To do this, he used a device, a durable velocity, called a cloud chamber. This is basically a vessel that's filled with a fine mist of water vapor. This shows up the tracks of the particles as they stream down through the vapor. Obviously an accidental discovery, right? I mean, you can all understand he was playing around and, uh, you know, with, with cooling uh, substances for some other purpose. And then he noticed when he looked in the substance, he was seeing tracks flying through and he's saying, holy shit, what the hell is that? What, what the fuck was that? And placed inside a magnetic field, these tracks will be deflected one way or the other, depending on the electric charge of the particle. So positive particles tracks then one way, negative the other. Anderson found evidence of particles that look exactly like electrons, <coughs> which are deflected. Okay, now they look exactly like a, a trace through a, cl a cloud chamber. There are a bunch of residue left behind, smoke. So like smoke from a train. And he's saying he can tell the difference between these two trains, proton, electron. He can tell the difference. Now they can't really tell the difference the only way they tell the difference is based on speed because they know the protons are heavier. Okay. So that smoke moves slower than the electron smoke because it's lighter. It moves faster and they're being pushed by opposite different forces, obviously. So, you know, that can also be the explanation, the simple explanation. Um, <clears throat> and their velocity runs out, but when they first think their initial, when they're getting pushed by a force and they always have to be pushed, there always has to be a voltage that caused the movement. That's what accelerators do with all that megavolt stuff. That that's just gigavolts. They're pushing things with voltage. And you stop pushing and they stop going. That's the rule. So it's the release of energy. So it's like if I said two electrons were for in, a, in an atom. So the atom is basically made of electrons, okay, that are pushing. So the electrons are at the, the points, right? And... They're, they have this pushing force, all these little ping pong balls bouncing back and forth between the ping pong balls, bouncing back and forth. You can sort of understand if this electron goes free, that pushing force still exists and it's going to push that electron. That's the voltage, is the pressure. So you want to make an x-ray, you have tight electrons, electrons are close together. And if the electron gets pushed, um, you know, it's going to get a lot of energy because it's getting pushed by x-rays. in the opposite direction. He had discovered Dirac's anti-electrons particle. So again, just it's just an assumption based on what they expect to happen when you shoot something through a piece of lead. They have this expectation that every time it comes out the same speed, when you could sort of just intuitively understand that there's probably a variability. You know, there's lucky protons that don't hit too much shit, and then there's unlucky protons that hit a lot of shit. And so you have some that come out slower and some that come out faster. And all they're basically doing is saying, look, here's a proton moving too fast, so it can't be a proton, it has to be an electron. But that's all they're doing. They're, 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 they, have no, they have no real evidence of this. All right, so here's some more comments. Yeah, I should have said it's easy to abuse abstraction. Okay, close enough. I've been thinking about the fact that math is man-made oh that's not the problem with math there's nothing man-made about math two-ness is a real thing this is a real thing two-ness three-ness is a real thing and the idea of combining three-ness and three-ness and getting six-ness that's real stuff math is not a fake thing the point is is that formulas where you take variables and put them together and say there's an association between how tall i am and how wide i am and how much i weigh there's a relationship. So you can make a formula. Nothing wrong with doing that. Absolutely nothing. <clears throat> but that explains effects. It doesn't explain what causes me to have mass. All right. Anyway, it probably doesn't have the ability to completely describe the universe. Well, that's clear. It's 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 a it's the simple. It's this. It's the most crude simplification, right? I mean, you've reduced me to a width, right? A depth and a height, 
Okay, now you can't get cruder, could you, in terms of missing the fact that I've made of different substances? You know, <clears throat> so yeah, it's it's a, a cr the crudest of simplifications. So we're left with abstractions like Gary's theory. Well, again, you can say my theory is an abstraction. I think that's just horseshit. It's a model, and it's I think damn accurate in the sense that it's consistent with the fucking evidence. So you can call it whatever the fuck you want, but I think it's silly to call it an abstraction. When you put puzzle pieces together, you don't call that an abstraction. You don't say, hey, this puzzle piece fits, this puzzle piece fits, this piece fits, this piece fits. You don't call that abstracting. Of antimatter. So let's see, just show the damn crappy image of their, of their, this, their evidence. Show us the the big pile of evidence. Show us the little stupid traces in a stupid cloud chamber that gave you the liberty to say that's antimatter. Go ahead, show me where you prove the existence of antimatter. That you prove that that, pro that, that, that positron came from positronia. The Dirac equation is an impressive achievement. Its prediction of the existence of antimatter using abstract again it has nothing to do with unifying anything this does not fix wave particle duality this does not fix the the, the idiotic difference between bending space and, and magnetic virtual photons this in no way unifies anything this hype that this equation does something important is just so fucking bullshit it invented, it, it, it endorses a silly notion of reality that's completely superfluous to any real physics in the real world. Nobody building anything or doing anything is thinking about freaking antimatter. They're not putting antimatter in your fucking computer. It's nowhere. Even quantum bullshit, even that stupid qubit crap doesn't rely on antimatter. Mathematics alone would be enough to make it a significant milestone in the history of human thought. Oh, amazing! <laughs> I mean, that's like a truth seizure. How the fuck could he say something so preposterous? I have to hear that again. I mean, could you could you hyperball? It's like the biggest hyperball I've ever seen. How do you grow such huge hyperballs? I mean, what a pile of fucking steaming, stinking shit. The Dirac equation is an impressive achievement. Its prediction of the existence of antimatter using abstract mathematics alone would be enough to make it a significant milestone in the history of human thought. <laughs> a significant milestone in the history of human thought. Amazing. Uh, GPS doesn't even work technically, okay, by Einstein's explicit math. It's really a little bit off. But clearly, it has nothing to do with GPS working, okay? It has to do with how um, any atom that's doing stuff, right? It's doing stuff. So it's like me bouncing up and down. If I'm bouncing up and down in the ground, right? And then you say to me, and I'm bouncing up and down, you know, one bounce per second, let's say. And then you say to me, go to the left, all right? Uh, I'm stuck because I'm, I'm bouncing up and down one time a second. But if I have to go to the left, I have to take time out of my bouncing up and down to go to the left. So that means I'm not going to bounce up and down as fast, am I? No, I'm going to bounce up and down a lot slower the faster I have to go left. The more distance I have to go left, the less time I can spend going up and down. <laughs> okay, it's that that's simple. So it's multitasking. So when you put give something velocity, you force it to multitask. Now the real trick of GPS is the irony is the satellites are the ones that are actually okay, not time that we're the ones who are moving too fast. The things on the ground are the things moving too fast. Because in literal fact, we're bouncing in the gravity. We're bouncing in very strong gravity, which means we're bouncing in a much higher frequency. So we're doing an Elise line like this, where the satellite's doing an Elise line like this. 
okay? So our total distance, if you added up all the up and downs, like a basketball bouncing, the basketball player is only going two miles an hour. The ball is going 17 miles an hour or more because the ball is going up and down, up and down, up and down, and going forward. It's doing both things. Can you get it? That's all this is. There's no time dimension. There's no fucking goddamn bent space bullshit. None of that crap is happening. It's just you're sitting there forcing matter to multitask. And when you force it to multitask, it can't do both things at the same speed anymore. It can't do what it was doing before at the same speed. So that's why a radioactive particle decays slower when you give it velocity because the atom can't do the same thing it was doing. So everything it was going to happen, if something was going to happen in 10 minutes, well, if you give it velocity, it's going to happen in 15 minutes, okay? Because it's not going to do the same number of rotations and the same movements. Everything's going to be compromised by the fact that you forced it to do something else. <clears throat> assholes pro gun i mean you, you walk around with a, a fucking screen name like that and like oh that's not gonna bother anybody <sighs> idk if i agree one or three exists i don't even know what that means again you want to pretend math is broken go ahead it's just stupid there's nothing broken about math how they're using it is is bad it isn't a bad thing just like guns Guns don't kill people. Fucking idiots do. Anyway, why do you accept C as a limit, but not the rest of relativity? It's not part of relativity. The fact that it was a limit, it was a limit long before Einstein fucking showed up. We didn't have Einstein equations to figure out that light was a limited speed and that the light was moving at the same speed as magnetism and the other forces. They already knew that before fucking Einstein. Maxwell existed before Einstein. You dumb fuck. It's not Einstein's relativity didn't create the fucking speed limit. Reality created it. There's no evidence of anything moving faster, you dumb shit. God, I hate these guys. But I didn't want to, to get you onto philosophy. Well, whatever. I don't care. Fuck you. I, I mean, I, don't, I just don't understand you people. You, you, I'm sitting here pointing out how their theories are rubbish. They're non-mechanical, non-physical explanations, a bunch of invisible mans, and you're wasting my time with this bullshit about some philosophy of how we should understand what a math is. When a math is obvious, two plus two things. Those are concepts, rock solid. Being partnered with something is a rock solid concept. Two trees, there are really two trees there. It's a real fucking thing, not a fake thing. And if I have two sets of those twos, then I have something called four. It's a real fucking thing. Man, people are just so dumb. How can this planet be covered with so many dumb fucks? Oh, you're too stupid. Satellites are exposed to more gravity. Okay, I'm going to block you because you obviously don't know shit. That's not the truth. We're exposed to more gravity, you dumb shit. The, the pressure difference is greater on the surface of the Earth. You can't get greater pressure than on the surface of the Earth, shithead. You're just too stupid. I'm not going to argue with somebody who knows nothing about the subject. Get shot. Get what you deserve. Live by the fucking gun. Die by the gun. In your colon. Slow and brutal. But within just a few years of publication, first Dirac and then others sense that his new equation was telling them something profound, something completely new about nature. And they were right. But the <laughs> So he still hasn't proven any of this. He didn't show us a shred of evidence, not one shred. He implied there's evidence, but he didn't show us any evidence. Relation hidden within Dirac's equation would take the best efforts of the greatest minds 30 years to uncover. Well, it's more horseshit. More, they never fixed anything. They, they're stuck with the duality. They never unified anything. He's talking like this. Somehow they. this is a success story somewhere in here. From Dirac to success. No, from Dirac to preposterous failure. The problem with Dirac's equation was this. It doesn't work. It's nonsense. It's fucking a three bear story. 
although it was incredibly powerful and had led to the discovery of antimatter. Again, they just so they discovered it. They, they didn't discover anything. They didn't prove anything. They haven't still have no place for these fucking positrons to exist. There's no place for them to live in the atom. There's no there's no accounting for their mass, their substance, so they have to give them zero mass. So they have some thing that's less light than a fucking photon. Positrons are bigger, but they weigh less than fucking photons. Does that make any sense? No. Oh, dude. Yeah. Fuck you. Dude. Boy. Shove that shit, boy. <laughs> Little boy. <laughs> Jesus. Dude. Ultimately, it could only describe a single electron. It fails completely to explain what happens when there is more than one electron present. What was needed? <laughs> what was needed is more special anti-dark <clears throat> fake matter, because now we have a dilemma: where, who, where is with the Well, the anti-particle can't make a decision. He can't figure out which one is his real twin. So he doesn't know what to do. Who shall I annihilate with? Was a new theory. A theory which explains how electrons interact with each other. You know, we interwhacked? They interwhacked with each other? He's talking like Bugs Bunny now. And that turned out to be the most difficult question of the mid 20th century. Yeah, just a difficult question. How do electrons interact? They don't interact. They bounce off of each other. That's all they ever do. One electron, another electron, force trapped between them. Oh, they can't get close to each other. So they have to deflect off of each other. That's all electrons do. They deflect off of each other. <clears throat> Period. They repel each other. That old theory still is true. That's what they do. <clears throat> but when an answer came, it was to bring with it an unexpected revelation. More revelations. And, and it's literally from the Bible. This is literally, they, they should use revelations because that's exactly what they're talking. The revealed truth through woo-wooing. Woo-woo. Give me a woo-woo. More woo, please. This office in Caltech, just outside Los Angeles, used to belong to the great Richard Feynman. In our story of so many geniuses of science, Feynman stands, in my view... So, so this is just, this is going to be terrible. Because this is a tiny part of Feynman. So as much as I think Feynman was a, a theoretical, I mean, a, a, a theater person. He belonged to in theater, okay? Not, not theoretical phys physics, but theater. Um, a theoretician. <laughs> yeah, he should have been an acting coach. Um, Feynman, does, this isn't the core. The playing with the Dirac nonsense of creating, you know, saying, look, you can get away with doing this, okay? Like the equations will actually work if you do this. You take a future event, okay, with energy, and you bring it back to the past, okay, and you have it cause an, cause an event. And then you can have the energy from that annihilate in the future. And so you can borrow from the future. And, you know, it's like it's deficit spending. It's, it's completely not going to work, okay, that the card runs out. It's nonsense. The universe can't work that way. But he liked playing with it because the math allowed you to do it, and that, and he conceded. He's just playing with it. He didn't. He did. He Feynman didn't say this was the import. His his important contribution to physics was playing with this stupid timeless electron crap because he knew that wasn't the fucking truth. God, it's so bad. I like how these documentaries don't know if positrons exist, but they make them seem like the most important particle ever. Right. When all they did was play math games with them. They're absolutely useless for anything other than some stupid math game. Earth shields us from gravitons. Well, I mean, you know, uh, this is just more crap. There's no definition of a graviton. So why are you putting it in a sentence like everybody knows what that means? 
And how, how exactly does it shield us from gravitons, idiot, when we're obviously being hit, the gravity gets stronger on the surface of the earth and gets weaker as you go further away. So how exactly is the shield working? <clears throat> Therefore, we are hit by less gravitons than satellites. I, I am sorry, you're insanely stupid. Insanely stupid. I mean, it has nothing to do with a single fact, a single observed experimental fact. You're talking absolute rubbish. Uh, therefore, we bounce around less, therefore slower than satellites, not faster. Well, I'm sorry, then GPS wouldn't work. The very the fact is they have to accelerate the clocks on the satellites to match us. No, decelerate them. We're the ones that are time dilated. We're the ones moving slower. The satellites have to be synchronized with our slow time. We don't have to synchronize to their slow time. So you have it backwards. You don't even know the truth, you dumbass. And don't show up here again with another sock account, fucker. <clears throat> Just giving you advice. Um, but obviously you're an idiot. You don't know anything about physics. You, can, you cannot say the word graviton. It means absolutely nothing. It has no definition. You can't say that. You can talk about the force of gravity or something like that, but you can't say the word graviton, asshole. Conventional physics doesn't believe in the graviton. It's not in the standard model somewhere, the graviton, as a defined particle. It's one of the things they haven't found yet. Oh, they're in Feynman's office now, yes. Somber, but doesn't bouncing make things progress slower? <clears throat> well, you're saying that if the first thing I'm doing is walking, and then you tell me to bounce, then obviously I'm going to walk slower. I was using the analogy of bouncing, and then you're telling me to, to go in a direction, then I'm going to bounce slower. The point is, is multitasking means you can't do the tasks at the optimum speed, either one of them. <clears throat> oh, damn. Um, <clears throat> because motion is taken up by bouncing. Yes, I'm just saying you're just reversing my analogy. You're just anti-particling on a perfectly good analogy. So you're just saying, okay, I'm walking five miles an hour, and then you ask, you tell me I have to bounce up and down. I can't still, if you know, in the same amount of time, uh, moving the same speeds. I can't do it. Uh, I don't know what that means. Faster speed, slower, slower time. I, I, why, why are you making this complicated? I mean, it's just so obvious. If I'm dancing as fast as I can on a stage, I'm dancing as fast as I can, and then you ask me to move stage left, I can't possibly do the same number of dance steps in the same amount of time because now some of my steps have to be in a direction. I mean, <laughs> it's not complicated. <laughs> You're flipping pancakes up and down you're on a spatula, you know, and then you have to go answer the phone. You, you don't get it, right? I, I can't keep flipping if I have to go answer the phone, right? I have to stop flipping. And whatever. You're just too stupid, you people. You just can't. You know, just this, this isn't. This is the part I shouldn't have to go over and over again. Multitasking means you can't do the task the same speed. If there's two tasks and you do them at a certain speed every fucking time when you do them independently, and I force you to do them both at the same time, you've got to be able to understand you can't do the two tasks at the same speed, at the maximum speed. You have to do them at some compromise speed. One of them has to be completely sacrificed or you have to take a little bit off of both. and only to Einstein in the list of greatest 20th century physicists. Oh, Jesus. I, well, second to Einstein is an insult in a sense because Einstein was a one-trick pony kind of guy and he was wrong about everything. I like Einstein, but he was just fucking wrong with, about just about everything except saying spooky action, good move there. He was wrong about the nuclear bomb even, right? I mean, he predicted... The odds of you being able to shoot neutrons into the atom and blow it apart are, are like me going in my pajamas and shooting wildebeest uh, on the moon, blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, a year and a half later, a guy does it. So, I mean, Einstein wasn't exactly uh, perfect. And in my opinion, like I said, he, 
he would have been he, he wanted to be a plumber he basically said i would well, rather have been a plumber he should have been a plumber because he was a shitty physicist You see, Feynman wasn't just a common or garden genius. Many refer to him as a magician. He was so smart, such an innovative thinker. This is such horse shit. He, he, was, he, he turned everything into, you know, gross simplifications. That's just so irritating. So why are we faster than satellites? So you're just going to keep doing the same thing again. I already pointed out. Because we're traveling more distance. If you have an least line, so you don't even know what an least line is, but if, if you're bouncing in a direction, and the ball is going up and down, up and down, up and down, and you have another ball that just goes this way, right? You can sort of understand the ball that's going up and down has to be going a lot faster to get to the same end point at the same time. It would have to go incredibly fast to get there. So we in the strong gravity are doing the quick bouncing the satellites in the moving fast in the weak gravity are only bouncing a little bit so the total distance they're traveling versus the total distance my atoms are traveling because my atoms look my atoms look like they're not going anywhere right now right they look like they're standing still well they're not they're accelerating down and the earth is pushing them back up they're moving a lot of distance, even when I look like I'm not going anywhere. Oh, I get it now. Thank you. Good. And like Einstein, he became this mythical figure, certainly a household name. Feynman was a liar. Uh, mythical. Yeah, well, it's, that's what they ought to do. It is all mythical. These are all mythical characters with mythical voodoo. They're like puss in boots with a little magic bag of sparkles and the fairy godmother and Jimmy D. Cricket. That's what all these talking heads of physics are. They're a bunch of, of Disney characters talking shit. When you wish upon a star, blah, 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 the black hole will come and it'll give you lots of candy. He's a life character. He, he had a huge personality. He loved cultivating and telling anecdotes about himself. Yes, he was an eccentric and sort of interesting character. Just leave it at that. Why do, do, do you have to glorify his, like he had the most magnificent personality in the history of mankind? No, he was a bit of an arrogant, obnoxious asshole in an awful lot of ways. Okay, it's like he, he, he basically thought that if I didn't think of it, it can't be thought of. That was pretty much his attitude towards the world. Well, if I didn't think of it, uh, you're not going to think of it because you're all dumber than me. Do you know about mock gravity? Duh. Does it prove gravity is really just light? It's not really just light. Light is really just gravity. You got it backwards. Light is just gravity at a frequency. Light is the eccentric thing. It's the thing doing the different thing. Gravity's doing the who cares? I don't give a shit about your, I don't need no fucking frequency. So gravity is basically saying, I don't need no fucking frequency. But obviously you haven't spent any time researching this channel at all. This is process has been going on for seven years. I have a unification theory, blah, 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 blah. There's start here videos on the channel page. Go watch some of those first because you're going to be way behind and you're going to be asking questions that have been asked 5,000 times and I'm really going to get annoyed. So, you know, this isn't the kind of place you just show up and uh, start talking about what I know. Now, if you want to talk about a specific piece of this video or an accusation these assholes are making or something specific that has some sort of evidence somewhere, fine. But there's just no point in me having to tutor you personally about what I've been doing for seven fucking years and what the thousand videos on this channel are about. That would be silly. He used to frequent strip clubs. He had affairs with his students. He was even- Yes, well, that's really classy. So I don't even know why you had to bring that up. I mean, that's just fucking, you know, <laughs> you're basically saying it was a bit of a fucking pedo. All right, taking advantage of little 17, 18 year old girls you know, as a, as a 50 year old guy. So what you're, you're sort of making a, a, a crack about, uh, you know, the guy had no standards. He really didn't give a shit about principle, <laughs> you know, and he just took the tail when he could get it.
So yeah, <clears throat> makes him sound like a bit of a jackass. So thanks for throwing that in. Oh, I ha here's a name to add to the contest list. Andrew D Dotson. Who, who the fuck is that? But I'll look it up. Just grab the name for posterity. Dotson. I don't think it doesn't sound like anybody. But we'll see. If it is somebody. ...to go to orgies. But his greatest contribution to physics was the part he played... He's a physics graduate in school. So what does that mean? You mean he's an undergraduate still in college? Or what does that mean? <clears throat> ...in developing the next phase of quantum mechanics. So we got no proof that this Dirac crap was anything. And now we're going to talk about the next phase of quantum mechanics. When they still hadn't figured out how to get the first phase right. The first phase was still in huge doubt. Uh, well, the particle creates a new unit multiverse. Uh, no, no, the, the particles have uh, radar and can do calculus. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Copenhagen. Yeah, they still haven't fixed any of this shit. Feynman and his contemporaries were attempting to pick up the atomic torch from Paul Dirac and develop a theory that took our understanding of the atom literally a quantum leap further. Like Dirac's antimatter equation before, the intention of the new theory was unification. Again, this bullshit that somehow any of this crap unifies anything. It can't possibly. They, they Again, Feynman didn't even deal with the wave-particle duality beyond saying, Look, it's light is not a wave. It's a corpuscle. He was clear about that. So he didn't even buy into the wave theory or Huygens. And he basically was saying, yes, God plays dice with the universe. He was basically arguing for, yes, there's random. <laughs> That's what he was saying. How does that unify anything? It's, it's complete woo. It's like just giving up. <clears throat> Feynman just gave up on a right answer. Yeah, well, the point is, is people on the list should have something to do with this channel tangentially and and or be somehow famous so people can know who the hell they are or, you know, something like that. So I'm just saying adding any old, here's a physics student. I mean, I don't know if that's going to make much sense, but we'll see what his videos look like. And then I can make a response. You know, maybe he makes stupid, shitty videos and I'll make a response video. And then it's good to have his name on the list because I made a response video that he probably doesn't pay any attention to. How do you deal with my with the cognitive dissonance of denying that light acts as a wave? Again, this acts like where does it act like a wave? It creates it 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 bends. It shoots it to a location. How does it act like a wave? Waves go up and down, idiot. Okay, <laughs> that's what waves do. They go up and down, or they go nothing. Where's the where's the where's the two slit experiment where the pattern is blinking on and off, blinking on and off, blinking on and off. Where is that happening? Oh, that's right. It's not. So it's nothing like a wave, actually. Not a damn thing. What is it exactly like? It's like sort of like a prism and other things like diffraction, you know, like where you put two surfaces next to each other and you diffract the light. That's what it looks a lot alike. It's a lot like diffraction. That's what it really looks like. And in photons, the pattern doesn't go through the wave. The, it doesn't get gradually light and then gradually dark and then gradually light and gradually dark. It doesn't do that in the photon experiment, asshole. So why don't you explain why the electron experiment looks really wavy, but the photon experiment looks really barry. Why don't you explain why there's a difference? I can explain why there's a difference because the electrons bounce off of electrons. They don't hit each other. They bounce off each other's force. So they slide uh you know in in all kinds of angles that's why it's a blurrier image and the photons are doing something very exact they're bending at a very exact amount because they're hitting an electron giving it energy the energy is repelling and it goes back out a new photon in a new direction i mean you're a dumbass fuck you <laughs> there's no cognitive dissonance in recognizing there's no wave particle duality there is none 99% of the evidence points to photons being corpuscles of light. So again, you're basically saying, why do you think Richard Feynman is uh, uh, right when he says, it's not a wave, asshole?
I play this video now numerous times. He says it explicitly. He's the father of your stupid, retarded quantum mechanics, and you can't even get it right. He's basically saying, fuck Huygens in the ass. This wave shit is nonsense. There is no wave interference. Okay, there's just probabilities. So fuck you. We deal with cognitive dissonance. Oh, I'm just going to fuck people. They keep bringing this shit up. It's irrelevant. By explaining it with a theory better than the current theories. Yeah, exactly. I don't have any cognitive dissonance, so I don't have to deal with any cognitive dissonance. I don't have any. All right? If there's a problem, something doesn't match the evidence, I don't have any cognitive dissonance. I have concern that my model might be incorrect, and I see if there's some way I can fix the problem, some some resolution, if there's some way I'm not seeing, something I'm not seeing. But I don't have any dissidence about it at all. Well, you're an idiot. Light is a wave. There, you've declared it so, not with any evidence. And again, the lord of quantum mechanics says, no, it isn't, jackass. It's a corpuscle. Waves don't make photomultipliers work corpuscles do since when do bits of waves follow straight lines across great distances without spreading well again since when do you take the word wave and completely fuck it in the ass and say we're going to just redefine what a wave is yeah somehow a wave is a straight line perturbation <laughs> so anything at a frequency is now a wave so all i have to do i can have a wave of cannonballs i can have a wave of bullets a uh, wave of torpedoes, a wave of any, anything I shoot at a frequency is now a fucking wave. And even things that don't have a frequency, like an electron, just has a velocity. I'll call that a wave anyway. I'll just pretend it's a wave. Even though there's no evidence that it has a frequency at all, I'll just say when it's going 50 miles an hour, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, 70 hertz. I'll just make up crap saying that somehow it has a frequency when it doesn't have one. I mean, you people are so full of fucking shit. Light behaves as a wave. No, it doesn't. It behaves as a corpuscle that gets deflected when it hits things. Uh, it undergoes uh, refraction. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff is completely consistent with being a corpuscle that hits things. Just like any wave would. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not like a wave because waves go up and down. Again, you're still not getting it. There is no photon plus photon equals black. Obviously, the photons don't cancel each other out. They don't disappear. They don't annihilate. They obviously land in these other locations. So you don't have half as much light when you have your two slit fucking goddamn pattern, right? Because half the photons got annihilated. That never happened, jackass. The photons actually went to where the light bands are. That's not very wave-like, douchebag. You know, I'm just going to block you, this arrogant nonsense. I've already argued this stuff and provided evidence of it. You've you got a horseshit theory. You want to believe it? Go ahead. Believe in horseshit, fucker. But don't tell me there's evidence of waves. There's no fucking evidence of a wave. Yeah, oh, he just pointed out Maxwell. He just says Maxwell's equations. There's nothing in Maxwell's. There's no wave function in Maxwell's equations. There's no evidence anywhere that there's a wave anywhere. There's rays of force in fucking Maxwell's equations, you dumbass. Okay, at the R rule, at the R squared rule, and at the R cubed rule. That's what's in his fucking equation. No fucking waves, jackass. No frequencies. None of that horse shit in any of his equations. So just lie some more about the facts, liar. I'm not going to calm down. I'm just sick of lazy rhetoric and bullshit. I mean, this is this is stuff, you know, first off, these assholes show up here and they don't, you know, they haven't paid any attention to the theory and they're arguing it like they somehow can make the argument and they're not making an argument. They're just declaring. I'm declaring it's a wave. Yeah, it's not even that you don't see perfect sine waves anywhere. But again, it's just this idiotic idea that everything that has a frequency has now been declared by these assholes to be a fucking wave. And there's no evidence that it's any kind of medium that it's doing any of this perturbating bullshit or pushing thing. There's every bit of evidence that the individual bullets are individual bullets moving at a precise distance away from each other. 
It's a stream of bullets, a ray of bullets at a frequency. It is not a wave. They wanted to understand how electrons affect each other. In other words, it aimed to explain how everything works together through the electromagnetic field. Right, the electromagnetic field, which doesn't exist. The silly notion that somehow a photon has some sort of electrical property or magnetic property when neither force moves a photon at all. Photons are completely disinterested. Obviously, the force between the electron is made of the photons. They don't understand that. They think the electrons produce the photons through some sort of magic inside of the electron. They have no clue. They have no understanding whatsoever. And yet they make these proclamations about what's happening. They don't know what photons are. They don't know how they're made. They don't know where they come from. And yet they're making these proclamations that we have the answer when they have no answer. They call their unification project quantum electrodynamics, or QED. The project was, and, and actually QED, there's none of this entanglement, um, wacky particles, annihilation shit. None of that crap was in the original quantum electrodynamics. It was all just about the simple rules of photons hitting electrons and the fact that photons and electrons were did most of the work in the universe. And that's all it was, was an acknowledgement that photons and electrons are where all the action is. 90% of it. It was a formidable challenge, but the end result was magnificent. Nothing less than... Uh, amazing. Magnificent, he said. The end result is nothing. Nothing. They have nothing. There's no end result is magnificent. There's nothing. They still can't explain why two magnets attract. They haven't gotten rid of the wave particle duality. They haven't connected any of this quantum mechanics to bent space at all. How could this guy say there was some sort of magnificent conclusion when they have nothing? Feynman didn't even, again, you can watch every single lecture Feynman gave except for one, I think. Um, uh, and none of them have any conversation about antiparticles. Most far-reaching and accurate scientific theory ever. Amazing, the most accurate scientific theory ever. How does he get away with saying this absolute shit? Absolute shit. He predicts that, well, if you shoot a photon at my shirt, it'll come out white and then black and then brown. I predicted that. What? I, I predicted that uh, if you shine light on me, the image will be in the mirror and it'll come back into my eyes again. I predicted it. I, I obviously am the most reliable predictor in the universe. They're, they're predicting things we already know happen. There's, just, there's, there's no predictions. There's, they aren't predicting anything we didn't know was true already. Ah, just amazing horseshit. Take a little break. Plug in my smoker. Oh, it's not charging. Come on, charge. All right. Conceived. For instance, it predicts a certain property of the electron called its magnetic moment to have a vacuum. All right, so more horseshit. So because they don't understand how an atom even works. They think that it's going around and around, round, 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 round the atom, I mean the nucleus, and that it spends a certain extra amount of time on one side, and that gives it a polarization. So electrons that are in circular orbits don't have a magnetic moment, and only the ones that are in warped orbits, ellipses, have a magnetic moment where they're the furthest away from the photon possible, and that's their magnetic moment. But the truth is, is no, the atom is really just a bunch of stuff in tension, and all you do is migrate electrons and create pressure between them. But that's all you can change. And the polarization is just creating ions. If you put another electron into the package of electrons, that means there's more electrons. That means from a distance, you're going to see the electron force more than you'll see the proton force. And if I take away an to a couple of electrons, and we've got three electrons, then I'm going to see more proton force than electron force. That's all. That's the magnetic moment. <laughs> it's no moment. It's a real thing. And the moment sort of comes into fact when, when you move voltages, what you're doing is going from something that has five electrons to say something that's four. And you're saying, I have five. 
you, you now have five. And then this one hits it. You now have five. And then you now have five. And it's just moving the extra electron, changing the ions. So going, say, from three, five to three, five to three. So if they're all four when nothing's happening, they're all going four, 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 four. <clears throat> but when you start to add one extra, you make one a five, then the four is less than the five, if you get it. But I think it really goes down to three, actually. So when they combine, you end up with the a free electron. And this goes from positive ion to negative ion. So you end up with a three, five. So when the next one shows up, it's got a difference of five and three. Well, anyway, I don't want to get into the complexity of it. It's just, a, it's just changing. The only time you create the magnet is when you take things that are four, 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 and you make them five and three, five and three, five and three, five and three. That's creating the magnet. Because now you've created an atom that is stronger proton and an atom that's stronger electron. Stronger proton, stronger electron. Now you're creating magnets. So when the current's moving, there are little magnets moving like this. Okay, magnets are going jiggling back and forth, red, black, red, black, red, black, through the wire. That's all that's happening. The magnets are moving. The magnetism is moving. All right, the magnetic moment is the, is the procession of an electron on its axis. Well, that's crap. There's the, the electron doesn't have an axis, so dream on. Uh, and QM predicted it accurately. So again, just more nonsense. Sorry, uh, no, they're just ions, asshole. The magnetic moment is just the ionic moment without the, without creating, again, if the, if the, the atom doesn't have an imbalance in it, there's no magnetic moment. You can't create the dipole without an imbalance. Sorry, fact. It has to have an elliptical orbit in your theory. In my theory, there is no, the orbit is irrelevant. It just has to do with how many electrons uh, how far the electrons are from the proton. So the further away the electrons go, the, the stronger their impact because they end up closer and further away from the proton. So you've made a disproportion between the black force and the red force by creating a little tiny bit more distance. A little tiny bit more distance, black versus red wins at a distance. But anyway, it's in my videos. I explain all this shit. All right. All right. Also, the Higgs boson proves quantum field theory. So, again, it's just silly. It proves nothing. Absolutely nothing. Absolute rubbish. The model is rubbish, incomprehensible nonsense. Your silly gluons bouncing back and forth. They're all made up crap. I mean, you want to believe it? Go ahead and believe it. Complete fairy stories based on vaporous evidence. Go show me the evidence for your Higgs boson. A little jiggly line on a chart just like your fucking gravity waves. Little jiggly line on a chart. Poor shit as evidence. Fuck you. All right, just fuck off. No, you have no evidence. I can't find the evidence. You don't even understand how an interferometer works. Why don't you explain to me how the interferometer works? Where's the interference between two different photons, obviously? Somehow different photons have to interfere with each other. Even though quantum mechanics says, they're interfering with their own wave function. Somehow, different photons have to interfere in an interferometer, right, check ass? Because a wave function can't travel and hit mirrors, can it? No, that's right, because then it collapses, doesn't it, fuck face? Just fuck off. Another arrogant douche. Look, you can come on this channel, you can ask me questions, but I'm not going to accept this arrogant crap, okay, that you've proven something or that you have overwhelming evidence because you have shit for evidence. Post links to your fucking evidence, and I'll fucking rip it a new asshole. Go ahead. Post me a link to the, to the YouTube video you think proves, okay, your Higgs boson has proven something. Go ahead. Show me the video that explains how the Higgs boson proves quantum field theory. That there's 100 fucking idiotic fields in the universe. Electron field, proton field, positron field. Uh, whatever the, the the antiparticle to the proton is. Show me the evidence. You don't have any evidence, fuckhead. Trying to explain it by spin. There's no such thing. <laughs> I mean, the spin, the spin is just another made-up pile of crap. 
spin would change the momentum of any object that had spin. So then therefore the proton couldn't, I mean, the electron couldn't possibly be the same electron. Electrons are as samey as you can get. And if you start spinning them, they're not gonna be samey anymore. <laughs> Whatever, I don't, what, what are you even talking about? Leads to the claim. Who's claiming that the electron is spinning faster than the speed of light? That's not a claim of, of conventional physics. That's a claim of fringe physics. So why are you even bringing shit like that? That's what you pisses me off. You're bringing up fringe crap. Fucking tinfoil hat shit. Value of 2.00231930404. Experiments measure precisely the same number. <laughs> yes, conveniently. With the magical experimental machine that can do that which isn't doesn't exist so this is just like them detecting which we put our detectors on the two slit no you didn't put any detectors on anything you didn't detect shit so again so the, the, they're always talking about oh we got another place on our fucking number that tells us how heavy an electron is we've already seen how they keep changing the weight of the proton over the last 20 years it keeps changing the weight of the proton and know how they measure weight they measure weight ironically based on how it reacts in a field of, of magnetism that's how they measure its weight not fringe physics can can give you a page number to griffin's quantum textbook i i don't care about a page number to a fucking book i'm saying to you where there there's absolutely no conventional go sh go post me a video like this one even this al kahari guy isn't saying electrons are spinning faster than the speed of light i'm just showing show me where somebody says that show me where Feynman says it show me where uh de rossi tyson says it show, show me where any real physicist says it I don't even know what this means. At this point, magnetism in physics basically is magic. They, they understand that it's the dipole is being created by the atom. So they're not, they don't have that part wrong. I mean, obviously the atom creates the dipole. It creates a negative charge on one side, a positive charge on the other side. In a, in a, over a timed interval, there'll be more negative on one side, more positive on the other side. That's perfectly reasonable. Their model is wrong, and it's not exactly how the charge is manifested, because as I just pointed out, it has more to do with the fact that as you, as you move the charges different distances from each other, you change what they look like from the external world. The, the whole thing, the atom, ends up looking black if I have the electrons out here, and it ends up looking red if I have the electrons here not fringe physical can you give it uh, okay no i don't want to whatever weight does not equal mass uh, well that's sort of the point i'm making uh you can't weigh an electron in any sense you can just measure its charge <laughs> can't weigh one but i'm agreeing with you well you're not doing it in a, a way i find it all agreeable to start talking about how the speed of light is broken somewhere why the fuck would i want to have that conversation Classical physics breaks with magnetism and quantum explains it with magic. They explain it with a virtual photon that doesn't explain the difference between virtual photon that causes attraction and virtual photon that causes repulsion. They have no theory of how uh, the two, how the force is manifested, how it moves the matter. They have no theory. They have no force for magnetism. There's no force. There's a field, a magical field that somehow knows how to move things, but there's no mechanism to move them. And that's an agreement between theory and experiment to one part in 10 billion. More just bullshit. I mean, more insane exaggeration, just like LIGO. We can measure a human hair on Alpha Centauri, blah, 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 bullshit. It's an unprecedented level of agreement. Oh, it's horseshit uh, about something so abstract. Okay, yes, we have a, a, a scale where we can measure uh, one trillionth of an ounce or something. You know, some preposterously insane number, which we can't do. 
It's like measuring the distance between London and New York to within the thickness of a human hair. There, another just insane exaggeration. So does anybody believe we can do that? Of course we can't. Yes, that's right. Of course we can't. Oh, it's such a pile of shit. All right, you just, you pukes in your stupid philosophy. This We're talking about the physical experiments and how the thing physically functions. And you keep wanting to bring up this stupid idealism where I don't even know why this is coming up all the time. Why all of a sudden, two weeks ago, everybody's talking about idealism. What the, what, who, who brought up this word idealism? Is this a Jordan Peterson thing or something? Who all of a sudden said idealism is a real word that we should worry about? There's reality. You can either accurately describe it or inaccurately describe it. That's all there is. There's accurate descriptions and inaccurate descriptions. There's no fucking such thing as idealism, uh, uh, any other poopism, realism, physism, thisism, bizism. None. There's no other shit. There's either accurate descriptions or inaccurate. You're you're believing some asshole who says we have technology that in this circumstance in the micro world can measure something that's just as difficult to measure as a hair from New York City to London. Now, do you believe they have an instrument that can do that? I don't. They, they can't, they can't, they can't, they can't um, tell what slit a photon went through. And these assholes are going to tell me they can measure fucking hairs on fucking uh, the butt of an electron. The phenomenal accuracy of quantum electrodynamics. Oh, fuck you. I'm just going to block you. This reality is created by the mind. Fuck you. It's a physical universe. It's not created in your mind, you daydreaming lunatic fucking asshole. God, I hate these faggots. <sighs> I make the universe happy with my thoughts. Oh, man. How fucking up your own ass can you be? dynamics shows it to underpin almost everything we experience in the physical world it's as close to a theory of everything as we have amazing a theory of everything and explains nothing Feynman is asked how a magnet works and he has to go through five minutes of evasion because he doesn't have an answer and he tells me they got a theory of everything. You have a theory of nothing. You have a fucking theory full of invisible men and dark energy and fake matter and anti-humans. You have a fucking theory of shit. A theory of everything. Every shit, every kind of shit you have a theory of. But you don't have a, a theory of the things that, you know, the real things that aren't shit. Ever come. It defines the laws of nature at the atomic scale. It explains shape, color, texture, and the... Bullshit. 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 It does none of that. They almost everything interacts and fits together. Amazing that he can say this shit without getting arrested for being a preposterous liar. How can you say something that's just such a preposterous lie? That this fucking theory explains anything like color, anything like any of this shit. It doesn't explain any of it. You still don't know where a photon comes from, for fuck's sake. It underpins and encompasses everything from the biochemistry of life. To oh, God. It just, I just can't stand this. Jesus Christ. How does he get away with this shit? Why we don't fall through the floor. So what does QED actually say? Well, this is where the going gets very tough. Yeah, that's right. You're just going to make up a pile. Of, you're going to quote mine quantum uh, uh, dy electrodynamics. There's, he's just going to quote mine it. So the parts he's going to pick out are just going to be the wackiest parts for the last 70 years. And just forget about the, the rational parts. And forget about the part where, you know, Feynman said, you know, uh, photons are corpuscles, they're particles. It may be a wonderful scientific description of nature, but trying to understand what Richard Feynman... Uh, 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 yes, it might be a wonderful description of nature that is completely illusionary. There's no way you can find anything real in it. It's just scribbly lines. It's really a cool-looking bunch of scribble, but that's all it is, a scribble. Oh, I hate this. 
Neumann was doing with his theory is almost impossible. This is what he himself said when he introduced his theory to the public. It is my task to convince you not to turn away because you don't understand. He didn't introduce it to the public. He went to Auckland and gave lectures. So this is well after his introduction. So this phrase is a quote from one of his lectures. Uh, amazing. I mean, he just overtly lied. Like Feynman made some introduction here. I have a new theory of quantum electrodynamics. He never made any such announcement. He never showed up somewhere and said, I have a new theory of electrodynamics. And it. You see, my physics students don't understand it. That's because I don't understand it. Right. So this is exactly quotes taken from his lecture in like 1979. <laughs> Hardly his introduction to the public. I mean, it just, he already had done a lecture in 1960, whatever. In that lecture, he didn't say that horse shit. So we can see how much this guy gives a shit about the truth. I mean, obviously, he'll cut some truth corners here for effect. The inventor of the theory doesn't understand. What possible hope is there for the rest of us? And again, it wasn't the theory that he was trying to get people to understand. Is he had a mathematical gimmick, okay? And he doesn't understand why it works. He just understands it works. So that's the part he was specifically talking about is this one part of quantum me mechanics, which was using his little spinning clock idea to simplify the mathematics. Oh, amazing. With that disclaimer, I'm going to try and explain anyway. First, you have to abandon your most basic intuition about nature. Yeah, you, first you have to abandon being a reasonable person and be somebody who, okay, I'll accept talking bears and okay, I can accept blind mice wearing black glasses and I'll accept pigs that live in little houses. And... You have to give up the notion that empty space is empty. So again, there's no nothing. There's always a, there's a medium. So why don't you just say that overtly? Why don't you just say, we're all ether theorists that believe in magical jello. There's jello pudding everywhere in the universe and the jello pudding is just jiggling and we're just little jiggles in the pudding. I'm a pudding jiggle. Because you don't want to be a solid real thing. You just want to be a little jiggly piece of pudding. Let me try and explain. If I were to suck out all the air from this jar, you'd quite rightly say that having removed all the atoms, I'm left with a vacuum, a volume of pure emptiness. Yes, well, you can't do that. So why speculate on something you can't do? Quantum electrodynamics flies in the face of this common sense idea by saying that the vacuum is not, I repeat, not the place where nothing exists. Nothing. Yes, well, that's just nonsense. So that's nothing. Feynman never said the vacuum is full of something. He didn't say that. So I don't know why you're putting Feynman's name on that crap. Because he didn't say that. Nothing happens. Instead, it's full of stuff and is heaving with activity. <clears throat> heaving with forces. And Feynman, didn't, again, didn't deal with forces. He just dealt with effects probabilistic mathematical equations that define the effect. So here he's sitting there touting Feynman as if Feynman theorized about what empty space was made about out of. Feynman couldn't explain why magnets attract. I mean, this is just such horse shit. How could this possibly be true? Well, it's Cosmic background radiation. Yes, a bunch of radiation that doesn't have a frequency. Well, how do I tune in the free, the, the non-frequency radiation? Say if there's radiation that doesn't have a frequency, its polarization is too wide. How do I tune it in? <laughs> what, what device do I use to see it with? Oh, that's right, I can't see it then. Because the only way you can see radiation, detect radiation, is to detect the, the vibration it causes when it hits something. If it doesn't cause a specific vibration, it can't be identified. 
uh, an enduring vibration. Our eyes need to be hit by like six pieces of light. Six bullets have to hit the eye before it says photon. So when we say, I saw a photon, we're really seeing six bullets. What if there's a bunch of energy that doesn't come in rays, just comes in little tiny things at varying frequencies? <laughs> can't detect it. Can't tune it in on your radio. Well, let's imagine one tiny point in the emptiness. Common sense tells us there's nothing there. But quantum physics tells us there's only nothing there on average. And it's those two words, on average, that force us to rethink our understanding of reality. Uh, no, it doesn't. It's just such horse shit. Just, it's absolute horse shit. So they're just saying because we can mathematically take all the mass in the universe and spread over all the empty space, uh, that we've done something and say that for every millisecond there has to be a certain amount of stuff in every little bit of space but the, clearly there's no obligation for that to happen no obligation for uh, a, any piece of space to be occupied by something think of empty space like a bank account which on average has nothing in it as a physics academic this is a con atheism seems to lead to science denial you're insane go die I mean, what a pile of shit. Fucking idiot. Except I'm very familiar with. Some days it might be 100 pounds in credit. Other days it might be 100 pounds overdrawn. But on average, it has a zero balance. Empty space turns out to have... <clears throat> on average, it has a zero balance. Doesn't make any sense. Because the average would be what the net is. <laughs> and then certainly your average for six years, you could be over, you could be, you could have uh, 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 too much money in your account. And then for four days, you take the money out. And that wouldn't, the average, you know, that doesn't make any sense. That wouldn't average to zero. Similar accounting skills, but it can borrow energy rather than crappy analogy. So this is the borrowing energy part. So this was a tiny part of Feynman's career tiny part speculating about the fact that you could mathematically do this gimmick of borrowing and he thinks this is what Feynman's big contribution was what a pile of crap I don't think Feynman would want that to be his defining moment <laughs> I don't think so Funny. and this energy is literally borrowed from the future there you go all right so it's probably a good enough place to leave off because I'm just too irritated with people are too sucky <laughs> you know, I, I hate these live rooms now. I just hate them. They're just irritating. Just these assholes show up. They do no research. They have paid no attention to the theory. They just make these proclamations. Uh, you know, atheism somehow makes you unscientific. It's just insane. Believing in absolute rubbish theories somehow makes you a better theor uh, a better scientist. I mean, amazing stupidity. I mean, you can't even. You can't even qualify something this ludicrously stupid. Fables and fairy tales. People who believe in fairy tales should somehow be admired. No, they should be vomited on. All right, play a little more. Provided that it's paid back again very quickly. Oh, yes. Well, who says how quickly? <laughs> uh... Possession is nine tenths of the law. You know, once I have the future in my pocket, I don't have to give it back. In practice, what this means is that the borrowed energy can be used to create a particle and an antiparticle, which are spontaneously formed from the void. Right. You can go into the future and give birth to yourself or something. I can go into or the, the future, me go in the past and fuck myself and have myself as a baby in the future. Whatever. Bullshit this is. Heat, provided that a fraction of a second later they annihilate each other and disappear just horseshit 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 energy is borrowed out of nowhere it's turned into matter the matter then self-destructs back into energy 
just nonsense and it doesn't even self-destruct back into energy which m makes the whole thing is not even getting that part right it doesn't self-destruct into energy it gets rid of the energy the excess energy that you can't account for that you don't have a cause for that's what it's for it's getting rid of the energy for which you don't have a cause for but you can't let a bunch of energy loose for which you don't have a cause because that breaks conservation and this happens in an instant all over the void. In fact, in a stunning confirmation of Dirac's antimatter theory, the vacuum seethes with huge numbers. Confirmation. There's no confirmation. He's not going to show any confirmation. There's no confirmation of this crap. Of matter and antimatter particles, particles continually being created and annihilated. And there's no evidence of that happening anywhere. Down at the smaller scale. Hey, this is so simple in so many ways. I mean, I've sort of explained it before. But the, the matter is nothing without the force. The force is what creates all the movement. And it takes a certain amount of force okay to compress matter and then when you're compressing matter it's, you're locking force inside okay the force is getting trapped between the electrons it's trapped there and there's a little more between the electrons and the protons they're communicating with a little bit of force so there's force inside of here but the key force is between the electrons that's where the highest pressure is that's the key bit of trapped force and now there's less force in the universe you can sort of understand if the photons are trapped in there then they're not free they're not out here in the universe anymore. They're trapped inside of matter. So as you create matter, that is, you pressurize things with gravity, gravity are, is photons, just without a frequency. And so when you cram them into electrons, you turn gravity into a photon, essentially. So when gravity compresses electrons, it's gravity that's trapped between the electrons. But as soon as it's trapped, it starts vibrating because of the frequency between the electrons. And that's the photon. So the further apart the electrons are, the difference in the frequency. Now, when you get to radio waves, that's a different thing because that's different atoms producing the rays. The rays of, of radio waves aren't really ray-like. Okay, they're they're wave-like in the sense that there's a whole bunch of the stuff living at one time, but it doesn't need to be in a ray form. So it's not like an individual electron is producing that except by rotations. It'll produce one, and then it rotates, produces another, and then rotates, it produces another. So that's where you get the long frequencies from. See, everything gets a little bit subtle. There's always subtleties. One thing isn't exactly like another thing, and exactly like another thing. They're all different. A baby is different than a 10-year-old, and 10-year-old is different than an 18-year-old. Subtle maturities to effects. Um, but anyway. So, so, but the easy, the easy thing to understand is the conservation of it. To understand that as you compress more and more of the matter, you're leaving more and more force out of the external universe, and therefore it has less pressure. So you can sort of understand that the universe is probably just doing that simple thing. It, it just keeps changing the equation. It just keeps changing the percentage of the universe that's trapped between the matter bits and the amount of force on the outside. So as you put more as you create more matter in the universe by making atoms and suns you're converting gravity into matter essentially and <clears throat> so over time you start using up the force that's gravity and you have less of it <laughs> okay so there's less gravity and then everything starts to fall apart and if you look at the universe that's sort of what it, the evidence sort of indicates a little bit because you have these things called quasars that are basically galaxies you know and they're very compressed and they're the thing way far away really in the past so 13 billion years ago galaxies were small and now galaxies are big indicating that too much of the force got caught up in the matter and now the gravity is getting weaker and everything's falling apart and there'll be a point where they'll the balance will change again you'll convert the matter into energy you'll release the energy trapped between the electrons and then you'll have more force and it'll compress again and it just keeps doing that i think that's a much simpler and better explanation of the function
Space is a constant storm of creation and destruction. Physicists call it the quantum foam. The particles in the quantum foam come... Amazing. So this is a tiny percentage of physicists, and he says physicists call it. So another insane exaggeration, because I, I would argue that if I surveyed physicists, it's going to be a small percentage who say, oh, yeah, that foam thing makes a lot of sense. No, it's only going to be a fringe number. So, again, he's making a tiny fringe part of physics into standard. He's putting it in the standard model. Like, somehow the standard model has fucking foam in it. No, it doesn't. Come and go so quickly that we're completely unaware of them. We refer to them as virtual particles. But if we were able to... So, so we refer to them as magical, invisible men that come to the rescue. Slow time down, almost to a standstill we'd be able to see this seething activity, this constant creation and annihilation of matter and energy. It's the fabric. That is the made up story that you're selling like it's a fact, like you have some real hard evidence for any of this crap. No hard evidence for any of this bullshit. Little bit of fur sticking out of the side of a tree and they're creating a whole Sasquatch, there's lineage, you know, they're going back, what, where, what, uh, European continent or uh, country first Sasquatch came from, you know, uh, <laughs> giving us uh, the eye color of Sasquatch, all kinds of crap, a little bit of fur. Of reality itself. And from this comes the most jaw dropping idea of all. I mean, they ought to go to, there ought to be a place like propaganda prison, you know, send these people to propaganda prison. This is just propaganda. Quantum electrodynamics says that the matter we think of as the stuff that makes up the everyday world, the world that we see and feel, is basically just a kind of leftover from all the feverish activity that virtual particles get up to in the void. Oh, amazing. I mean, I don't, like I said, I don't, think, I don't think there really is all that many physicists who say, yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> yeah. That a bunch of foam made photons, and the photons turn into neutrinos or something, and neutrinos turn into matter or something. I don't think they believe any of this horse shit. So you, me, the Earth, the stars, everything is basically just a part of a deeper, infinitely more complex reality. Horse shit. Horseshit, horseshit, made up shit. Of course, when Feynman first started to develop his revolutionary ideas in Caltech in the mid 40s. Yeah, he didn't say anything about this crap. So, no, this is 40s. He wasn't doing this crap in the 40s. His contemporaries were horrified. Because at that time, the general opinion was that the quantum electrodynamics project was an unmitigated disaster. Uh, this is, I, I'm just saying, I, I never heard, Feynman, I never heard Feynman say anything previous to the 80s about any of this foamy crap. I mean, even I never even heard him say foam. Um, he just did the borrowing from the future thing. And, I, and I, from what I saw, he was basically saying it's a mathematical trick. This doesn't necessarily have anything to do with reality. The theory couldn't be solved. The equations had no sensible solutions. The mathematics had spiraled out of control. But Feynman believed that he could see a way through the mathematical complexity to a new truth. Let's see, gauge symmetries, field theory. What Feynman did with all the arrogance and confidence of youth was slash through the insanely complicated maths. Feynman developed a new series of revolutionary but almost childlike diagrams right and those diagrams have nothing to do with this horse shit. there's no foam there's there's no uh, neutrino well there are the neutrinos and we did use the standard models variety of particles but generally speaking they're they're basically 90 percent of feynman diagrams have to do with photons hitting electrons it's just basic common rational sense to explain his new ideas. Their elegant simplicity flew in the face of the complex maths of traditional quantum mechanics. 
they're just angular reactions you're just changing momentum and speed that's it there's nothing complicated here conflict seemed inevitable then in 1948 at the age of 30 richard feynman decided to unveil his controversial version of quantum electrodynamics with his idiosyncratic diagrams to the physics world bangity 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 bang and again it had nothing to do with any of this borrowing energy from the future crap and he chose the most important science conference of the american calendar set on the coast of pennsylvania the Shelter Island Conference was a physics celebrity circus. Present were Niels Bohr, the so-called father of atomic physics. The dis Again, all this, what is this theatrical crap? Bang, 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 bang. You can't get what's going on unless we have banging music. Uh, so a group of fucktards, you know. Well, I think the three bears is pretty good, but okay, I'll concede that little red riding hood is pretty hot. Girls in red hoods, pretty hot. So I am, I don't know, that's pretty cool stuff. Let's maybe go with the red riding hood theory. Discoverer of antimatter, Paul Dirac, and the man behind America's atom bomb, Robert Oppenheimer. The atmosphere, the stuff. So again, Oppenheimer just was the guy who organized the damn thing. You know, I'm not saying he didn't do some good stuff in physics. I'm just saying, you know, it was a collaboration and such. Conference was great. Confidence in quantum electrodynamics was a rock bottom. It seemed a hopeless mess. One after another, the physicists stood up and droned on despairingly about how they failed to find a solution. Then it was the turn of Richard Feynman. And his solution was basically to say, this is all has to do with the duality problem. It just has to do with the, the again, how, how do you deal with this fact that you have a pattern created that the interaction between photons and electrons, when you pass uh, 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 photons near matter, you change them and you change them by a predictable pattern. And it's just a, a way of de declaring how these reflections take place. So whether the reflections off a of glass or whether it's a deflection caused by a, a, a slit or whatever it is, and you just recognize the fact that it's basically sort of an easy equation in the sense that there's just as much likelihood of a left turn as a right turn. And you can just forget about all the left and right turns and just deal with the one that's probably gonna be the answer, the straight line. Nearly 30 years old, he stood up and took his place in front of the world's most illustrious scientists and started to unveil his new diagrams and equations. What happened next was astonishing. A row broke out, not so much over Feynman's weird description of reality. Physicists were used to weird by now, but because he dared to visualize what was going on, instead of using arcane, complicated mathematics, Feynman was describing what all his virtual particles were up to using his simple pictures. There was uproar. Niels Bohr, the father of quantum mechanics, leapt from his chair in disgust. He hated Feynman's diagrams because they went completely against everything he devoted his whole life to. Which is wave bullshit. And Feynman was getting rid of all the wave bullshit and just basically saying, look, it's a probability equation. Oh, anyway, this is, this is so bad. All right, so maybe we'll come back to this someday. Uh, maybe. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, like I said, I don't know if I'm going to bother doing live rooms anymore. It's just too irritating. We'll see. Um, it's usually not as bad as this, but we'll see. I mean, it's physics, and you know, it's just going to be. It's, it really is going to be irritating. I mean, I've tried to make very concise videos explaining some basic. Look, you have to just start with these different premises. If you're not willing to start with different premises, I can't explain a different way of viewing the thing because you have to accept the premises. If you're not going to accept them, then there's no point in you trying to scrutinize my theory uh, because you haven't accepted <laughs> the pieces that uh, that are the puzzle. Um, you know, it's just. Uh, but it's physics. I mean, it, yeah, yeah. You know. uh, it's. It, it, I can't do five minutes and 
and give you the complete theory in five minutes. It just ain't going to happen. Because uh, although the pieces are simple, the arrangements they can get into are complex. All right, anyway. But, I mean, you know, this shit where people just show up and say, it's, you're delusional, it's a wave. I say so. Fuck you. It's not an argument. I find the evidence oh, woefully lacking. Anyway, till the next time and such.